the next person we're going to meet um, represents a company and, and was the driver of that company and its growth um, when they were named 2011 Bioscience Company of the Year. And, you know, I can say amazing things about this company, and they have great people, and somewhere out there is Don Isaac, and Don Isaacs is on our board of directors and marketing communications for this company, and they do a fabulous job. But there's nothing more important at the end of the day than hearing the impact of life-saving innovation in the words of the person that matters most, and it's not the doctor, it's not the researcher, it's not the innovator, or the manufacturer, or the investor, it's the patient. It has changed my life in, in so many different ways in knowing that uh, I, I'll, I will be alive to get my heart transplant, um, which with before with my native heart, I didn't, I didn't have that peace of mind. You know, I, every day I worried about dying. Every day I worried if something was going to happen or um, if my heart was just going to stop or, or whatnot. Uh, and if you, you know, if you have the to uh, Syncardia Total Artificial Heart, you don't have that, you don't have that worry. Um, and, it's, and it's worth any surgery um, to have that peace of mind knowing that, that you're going to stay alive. So um, the machine is, is amazing. The artificial heart does what it says it does. It's not, you know, it's not a gimmick. Um, it's, it's a true life-saving device. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Marvin Slepian. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, personally uh, for the invitation to come speak and also on behalf of uh, the employees, uh, certainly the patients, uh, the founders, the board of directors, and certainly our uh, chairman and CEO, Mike Garippa. Uh, we uh, really are honored uh, that you have asked us to speak here today. Uh, in this position to talk about this concept of D1, D2, and D3, we've got this title of talking about the Syncardia story from the perspective of delivering. And I'm going to spend the next few moments talking a little bit about the past, the present, and the uh, future, where we're going with this. So it's great to be in this environment with medical entrepreneurs and innovators. And we all know, just as a, as a basic, and we've heard a lot of this uh, in some of the sessions earlier today, that we typically start with a problem, the unmet need. We may have some interesting, cool technology. We ask some diagnostic questions. Can we do it better? Uh, can we do it cheaper? Is there a cost benefit? Uh, what about reimbursement? We ask questions about the market size. Typically, if we're going to start a company, uh, can we make the product? Can we sterilize it? What about that whole uh, heinous regulatory path? And what about reimbursement? And will someone use it? Is it easy to use? Training, technology, longevity, the cost. These are the typical things that we all would deal with in starting the company. And I'm getting to the, how we started uh, Syncardia. We know that if you come up with an invention, uh, if I have a pointer, if we come up with an invention, uh, you may, this is the typical pathway where we reduce it to practice. I could use a new one. This is kind of dying. Uh, and then uh, we basically go through some initial testing, preclinical, first in man, various trials, and then we finally get approval. So if you think about company startups in the biomedical domain generically, you're starting with a lot of risk in red, and your goal, oh, great. And your goal is to attempt to uh, reduce, reduce risk. Uh, whoops, I think we've gone backwards. Uh, attempt to reduce risk over time as you attempt to create more and more reality uh, as you move your uh, product forward. Well, let's talk about the artificial heart and the story and how it started. So in the mid-1980s, the total artificial heart, which had an initial commercial development from Utah, was shut down by the FDA. 
1987, on top of that, Medicare issued a non-coverage decision uh, for the total artificial heart. By the late 1980s, this technology was completely mothballed. Then, in a second coming, as an appendage, really, of University Medical Center and U of A, uh, research was resumed, but then the project imploded yet again. We had issues with funding, and this is really how the whole story starts. So we had a double whammy, double hit against us, and that's how we start. So if you look at it in terms of this curve, we were in a very different position. A lot of money and time was put into this to make it real. The risk was being reduced, yet the thing was not going forward. So it's a little different as far as the skill sets of what you needed to do to move this forward. I want to give you a little background about the issue, the need, and, and uh, why the artificial heart. So heart failure is a big problem. We've heard about a lot of these diseases, and every one that you heard about today is truly uh, deserves technology development uh, like you've heard. But heart failure is kind of this insidious disease where it's really the final common pathway of all forms of heart disease. There are over 5.5 million patients in the U.S., about 20 million worldwide, uh, and just tremendous morbidity and mortality. If you look in terms of healthcare economics, this is the number one DRG, another, the number one diagnostic related group that Medicare spends their money on, the number one expenditure, the number one cause of admission to the hospital. If we didn't fix anything else and we just solved heart failure, we wouldn't have such a big issue in terms of healthcare expenditure and dollars uh, and the ex ex exorbitant costs. The sad fact is that heart failure will continue to grow because all of us, uh, the baby boomers and beyond are aging, and unfortunately, we don't have a cure for heart failure, so the epidemiology is going to double uh, within the next uh, 10 or 15 years. This slide emphasizes that whether you have artery disease or a muscle problem or a valve problem, at the end of the day, if the heart doesn't pump, you have heart failure. And the American Heart Association and New York Heart Association have various ways of classifying heart disease from mild to severe, I'm going to talk about the severe form, or class 4, or AHA stage D, heart failure. So I'm making you a little bit of a cardiologist here for five minutes. So basically, early heart failure is treated with drugs, but more advanced disease ultimately is best treated with a transplant or with a device. This curve shows you how things progress. You're fine until you reach a slippery slope, and then you're in big trouble, and if something isn't done, you're going to die. The ultimate therapy is heart transplantation. The sad fact is that there are easily over 100,000 patients in the United States that need a transplant, but the sad fact is that we only do about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 patients a year. That's a terrible gap. We have about 96 to 98,000 patients a year that just go unserved without adequate therapy. So even if you dismissed that half were too old and too sick, had other comorbidities, there's still a large need uh, and that is not met. So that's led to this new field of mechanical circulatory support. Uh, there are groups of devices called ventricular assist devices which help the, the ventricle uh, pump. And then if you're so sick that both ventricles are failing, you ultimately need a total artificial heart. Well, we go back in time and we remember uh, De Vries and Kalf in the 80s, who basically we all remember the name of uh, Barney Clark, uh, who had an implant. Uh, and there were four or five implants done, and then this technology really didn't go anywhere. There were onesie, twosie type attempts at other places, but ultimately the technology didn't move forward. Because there was competition at the time, and we were a little bit too far ahead. The idea was good, but we weren't really ready as far as the technology. And then the competition that emerged was the emergence of cyclosporin, that transplants which had started way back when with Christian Barnard and others which failed because of rejection, this drug now allowed transplants to go forward. So if you follow this, there was a convergence where suddenly there was a new need. There was the ability to do a transplant, but you couldn't just dial up to get a heart. And if a patient was failing, you needed a bailout type device. So in essence, when the artificial heart started, it's like a rocket and they wanted to go to Mars. It was too big a leap. They should have done an incremental step, maybe go to the moon first before they went on for the ultimate goal. And that brings it to a very Arizona uh, story. Uh, back in the 80s, when Jack Copeland had just come to the University of Arizona, uh, he was doing a transplant on a young patient. The heart failed because there's really no way to assess the viability of the heart. Uh, and they called out, and there was actually a dentist in Phoenix, I can't make these stories up, that was working on a heart. They brought it down, they put it in for several hours, and then they took it out and replaced that with a second donor, and the patient uh, went on. 
This is the famous cartoon where you see the FDA bursting in uh, because this was a radical thing to use a device that was unapproved. And this actually led to the change of CFR 21 that you can use any medical device to save someone's life once. Then you have to register it and conduct a clinical trial. And that's what happened here. When the dust settled, they got from Utah out of mothballs from Symbion the Jarvik heart. And the first successful bridge to transplant was done down at University Medical Centers. And a company was formed, and Jarvik was involved. But unfortunately, and again, nothing against Jarvik. I know him well, and he's a, he's a nice guy. But he's a little bit of a, uh, uh, a wild uh, a fellow in terms of the way he would present himself. He would publish in great journals like Playboy, as opposed to maybe uh, Circulation or, or JAMA. And the FDA frowned upon this. And this is a lesson as far as how you have to conduct yourself in the medical domain. The FDA came in and said there was lack of planning, many false starts, lack of focus, and they essentially sh shut down uh, the project at that point. I came to the University of Arizona in 1991, and I had an, a separate path of, of innovation and entrepreneurship in uh, biomaterials and other things. And I started uh, this technology called endoluminal paving, which is really the precursor of the first biodegradable stent. We formed a company called Focal, which went public in 1997. Uh, this was Bob Langer from MIT and ultimately was acquired by Genzyme in 2000. I also founded another company called uh, Hansen uh, with the uh, founders of Intuitive Surgical. So I had a lot of experience in starting things. So basically, we were at a point where uh, Jack Copeland came in my office and said, the university wants to shut this down. What can we do? And as an innovator, an entrepreneur in the medical space, you say there's only one thing to do. We're going to form a company and move forward. We formed a company called Syncore. It turns out the name was taken. We changed it to Syncardia, and our goal was to finish the job to basically get this technology, which we all grew up with in Life magazine, finally approved as a real uh, therapeutic. So what were the issues? We had many issues to face. We had issues to improve in terms of the technology. We had issues to understand medical uh, patient selection. We certainly had to put a corporation together. We had to bring in the quality system. All the regulatory issues, we had to raise a lot of money. We had to bring in the right management. It was, required a very different skill set. This is what the device looked like in its original configuration. Here is the heart, the drive line, and this large driver box. And this is a cartoon of the implant in the patient. Uh, the heart pumps at uh, stroke volume. That's the individual beat of 70 ml. It can pump up to 9 liters a minute. So this is a very large output. All of us sitting around here are, uh, have an average output of about 3 liters a minute. Unless you get excited by one technology, it may go up to 4 or 5. Uh, but basically, our outputs are about 3. So there's a lot of room for this device to compensate. The way the heart works is it uh, takes in all the blood that the body gives it back. And then ultimately, it pumps it all out to the uh, patient. There's always a little cushion so that as you increase venous return, you can pump more out. In other words, it can compensate for the demands that the patient needs to a certain extent. There are times when you want a total heart, not just a ventricular assist device. And I've, some of the conditions are listed here. I don't want to get into too many technical points. But there's clearly a major need for this, which is not satisfied by these ventricular assist devices. And the advantage of the total heart is it can pump blood to the whole body, improving circulation to the lungs as well as to the kidney and brain as well. So we were faced with, when we started Syncardia in 2001, with trying to get this thing approved. And we put together this trial which was going on, and, and we had to really solve the ultimate question of safety and efficacy. This is a class three medical device, probably the heaviest thing you could bring uh, through the FDA. We put a, the hypothesis was that we could save patients that were basically dying that had irreversible biventricular failure with this as a bridge to transplantation. The study was we would take these failing patients, we would remove their heart, they would have the artificial heart put in, then ultimately when a transplant was available, we took out the artificial heart, and then after one month, they exited the trial, but they went on, of course, to live the normal transplant life. We, five centers, 12 surgeons, pro most prominently at the University of Arizona, were involved in this trial. 130 patients with 95 in the implant group. 
This is typical, and I don't mean to uh, uh, gross anyone out with a picture like this, but basically these are these big inflammatory dilated hearts, and the insidious factor here shown with the arrow is that there actually is a blood clot here, and if you were to put in a ventricular assist device in a patient like this, it would suck it out, the patient would embolize, and they would have a stroke. So there are times when you just can't use a ventricular assist device. In this trial, despite the morbidity of these patients, we achieved success in 69% of the patients compared to a control group of 37%. That had never been seen before. We achieved the bridge to transplant rate of 80%, which was the highest and remains the highest to date of any uh, device for this class of ill patients. This is the curve and the data that we went to the FDA, and I ran that panel session uh, at the FDA. And, uh, not to uh, pinch ourselves, but we knew we would probably have a good day with data like this. In the orange is the control group. Without the device, that was your chance of survival. Whereas in the green, with the device, you clearly had a chance of survival. Uh, with the device, uh, you went on to have it for about 80 days, and then ultimately were transplanted. Without the device shown here in orange, within eight days you either died or you received an emergency transplant. Uh, did this make you a worse transplant candidate because you had this mechanical device? And the answer was no. Patients actually shown in green and the red dots did equally well uh, as the world's experience with transplants. People were able to walk uh, within two weeks. More than 80% of patients were up and they were walking more than 100 feet. Uh, nothing's perfect. We had a very small stroke rate, but this was lower than any stroke rate seen with any other mechanical support device. We were privileged to have this published as the lead article in the New England Journal. We received accolades in the New York Times. Uh, we received an FDA indication for use as an in-hospital bridge, what we really had sought after. Uh, and we received an accolade from the American Heart Association as the most significant advance in cardiovascular medicine in 2005. This is an example of a cardiologist, on, that's me on the right, Copeland on the left, a surgeon, and a patient, Bill Wall, who you may know from Phoenix. Uh, who uh, has gone on to be a ad, uh, an advocate and a, a major uh, cyclist, and this is at the Tour de Tucson. Here's another brief uh, video, if this will play. Um, my name is Vanessa Cirillo, and I'm 28 years old. Before I got the total artificial heart, I was weak, just felt always just tired and sick. Now I'm going to the gym three times a day. If I could take Big Blue home with me, then I would be happy with that. <laughs> it would make this, um, this situation, this experience, a lot easier. So as a young person implanted with this, she recovered very rapidly. This is on the device in the gym to show you how patients do get better with normal cardiac function. All right, if we move forward, this will go forward. So you might ask, well, we achieved all this. Are we done yet? You know, we're getting to this D3 theme. And the answer is no, because you have to, uh, have to think about, is this going to be paid for? And we not only did not have coverage, we had a non-coverage decision on top of our head. So we had another battle to fight. And it's different language. You have to be very cognizant of CMS. So I'm giving you an insight of someone who's been there. When you start something, think about reimbursement right up front, not as an afterthought. Because where, the, where Medicare is today, CMS, it's different language. Devices have to be necessary and reasonable, not just safe and effective. Uh, and they've changed the law in 06 as far as requiring a certain amount of evidence development. Well, we had done a trial. We compared biventricular assist devices, the bridge to transplant rate, this was done at University of Pennsylvania versus Arizona, and they had a 46% bridge to transplant rate where we had achieved the 77% rate with the artificial heart. The point here is that the bivads were reimbursed. And the bivads were twice as expensive as the artificial heart. So if you tell Medicare that you're paying for something which is twice as expensive and delivering half the outcomes, that they get and they take notice very quickly. So that then ultimately led uh, to receiving approval. This was another piece of data where in one medical center, this was abroad, they completely stopped using bivads and started using more and more in green, the artificial heart. In 2008, we received this provisional coverage to allow us to move forward. So we now had checked that box that we now had a reimbursement. And we've gone on to be able to show even in more modern data that the bivad success rate shown on the right 
is about 35%, whereas with the artificial heart, it's about 71% in the hands of many, proving the validity and value of this technology. So are we done yet? We have FDA approval, we have Medicare approval, are we done? And well, you saw Vanessa in the video, and this is in Germany at Bad Oeynhausen, where we had seven of our patients attached to what was then the big blue driver. Uh, and they're outside in a German uh, gray day, and you can see that uh, from young and old, all these patients are alive. Uh, but uh, you really can't go very far tethered to this giant 300-pound washing machine. So if you saw this individual walk into uh, the meeting here, you would never really know that he has an artificial heart. This was a young 40-year-old German policeman who, in Europe, we started working on a modified a VAD driver with the goals of bringing something like this back to the United States. He had a very bad uh, viral cardiomyopathy. He could not be transplanted right away. He was the first patient to go on this modified pneumatic driver, which we had tested in an animal model, and he really was the first guinea pig uh, to go on this, and he did superbly. And then we have had a series of these patients, uh, but if you uh, were, I met him on several occasions. Uh, he returned back to work. Uh, he could drive his car. Uh, he would visit with his uh, family and his kids. He used to go to Holland from Germany. Um, and uh, you'll see here in the next picture, he used to like to go to McDonald's. I always tell this joke. Now, as a cardiologist, I can't condone him going to McDonald's, but he doesn't really have to worry about coronary artery disease because he doesn't have a heart. On the other hand, on the other hand he has to worry about broad vascular disease. But he ultimately was transplanted. But the point of this uh, video is to prove that he, plus several other patients, proved the value and the validity that we could actually discharge patients. We started to look at data. We saw that we had more and more outpatient experience than inpatient experience. So the next tidbit sort of to pass along to everyone is that not only do you have an effective therapy, you want to make this a successful therapy, but a, a, a medical device company and a business. And it won't be successful unless you have these other elements. It has to be friendly across the board. Someone else used the term in terms of involving all the stakeholders. And they are the patients, the physicians, the hospital, and the payers. And if you can't get people out of the hospital, this technology will never fly. That's been the big move at Syncardia for the last several years, is to come up with a new replacement hospital driver that's more mobile, and then to come up with a complete freedom driver, we call it the freedom, which allows patients to go home completely ambulatory. Uh, this probably won't play, but here I am holding this in the lab. This is a small uh, driver. Uh, it weighs about 12 to 13 pounds with multiple batteries. It gives you a long backup. You can be out of the hospital. Uh, we received approval in 2010 to conduct a trial, which we have now largely completed. We have submitted the data to the FDA for review. Uh, we've done 127 patients. We needed 30. We had excellent results, so we, of course we have our fingers crossed that we should receive approval for this, uh, which will allow us to have a complete cycle of in hospital to discharge to out of hospital. This is in Europe. This is a patient who was on this for four years uh, who basically uh, is completely ambulatory. So again, I ask, are we done yet? Well, you have to keep your eye on the ball. So here we are almost uh, 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 cresting with everything, and then we find out that in 2010, Medtronic has decided to cease production of one of the key elements of our hearts. They're not making the valves anymore. And in the middle of everything, one of the, a small company called World Heart, which makes the polyurethane solution that we use to make the heart, they basically are, are facing bankruptcy and they're out of business. So a key lesson, control your supply chain for vital critical medical devices. So at this point, I was actually chairman of the board. I had moved on from being CEO and we had a second CEO, but it was really time for a change. And these are the hard lessons that you learned in, in a business that moves forward. Now we're now eight to 10 years into this. We needed a change in leadership. We needed to build on relationships that we had to be able to grow uh, sales and use. We needed to focus on what we needed as far as manufacturing. These are much more advanced concepts than the first days of a startup. Uh, so this requires a little bit of uh, uh, shoe leather being lost to get to this point. We tested many valves. We've settled on a valve that we are using today. We also decided we're going to control our supply chain, and we went and bought this reactor, which was a dinosaur that had started with DuPont and Ethicon and World Heart and brought it in and got this qualified with the FDA so that we actually could make our own spuds, and there is the polymer that we actually use uh, to manufacture the artificial heart. 
So we're now in over 107 centers. We've done more than 1,200 implants. And we're now beginning to feel the benefit of, this, of our third phase. And really, credit goes to Mike Garippa for his superior job that he's done in CEO leadership coming in as, as the third hitter here to give us this J-shaped relationship and a takeoff in terms of uptake. So we think that as far as the corporate side, the finish line is a little bit uh, more in sight, but we can't, we, uh, can't uh, uh, bet on anything yet. But we have uh, crossed over from being non-profitable to being profitable in 2011, now in 2012. And these are tough roads to get to this point. And I have to tell you, this is a long slog. We're working on a smaller heart to expand our product line, a, a device which will serve women and uh, adolescents and children. We're even going to try a 30cc heart. Next generation products include the Freedom Driver, which uh, number two, which is smaller, uh, less noisy, a longer battery life. We are working on a futuristic heart, which will not require air, which will be uh, electrically driven and eliminate the drive lines. And we're certainly looking at alternative uses for our polymer, which could be used in other aspects in medical device design, tissue engineering, and other things as well. But some of the very future things that we're working on in my lab, we're incorporating this uh, area of work that we've been involved in with stretchable electronics, where we put in electronics into polymer systems, and we're thinking we may act, this is a balloon catheter that was built, this was published in Nature a couple years ago, we're thinking that we might actually make a smart membrane and put this in. Uh, we're also working on completely biodegradable electronic systems, which may be incorporated into a device like this as well. So if I summarize, I've gone through a lot here, but let me make a few key points. There are many key ingredients to making a successful biomedical startup. And this is a startup further down the road that started with a whole backwards arrangement of having been there with the risks taken out but needing other requirements. You need good science, you need good technology, you need good clinical expertise, you need good management and finance, all built on a solid regulatory point. Many times we look at uh, a device company through one lens. We may be science driven or technology driven and we always push on that. I am here to tell you and I too have been involved in starting more than a dozen companies. You have to keep your eye on all of these aspects because any one of these if left unchecked can bite you and undermine the entire effort. And we had to deal certainly with management issues and with finance issues because a lot of the science had already been proven. So some of the take home lessons are as follows. You always have to maintain your clarity of mission and vision. Don't have too many things you're working on. Work on a very focused thing. You have to put in a solid quality and regulatory backbone from the get-go. It'll save you time and money. You always have to be audit ready in a company. You have to make sure you have enough money for the long haul, a sort of built to last strategy. You have to have the right manpower and you may have to change leadership in midstream to d fit the different times of the company. You want to get involved with the FDA right up front. Don't wait till the end. They are not your enemy. They're your friend, and you have to work with them. Also remember that CMS is not the FDA. Each agency in the federal government has pride and independence of their own mission. So I would meet with CMS early. We did that. When we did our regulatory work, we invited CMS to come to FDA meetings. We sort of got a two for one and saved on a lot of uh, otherwise painful things we would have to do down the road. So let me just conclude. I think the artificial heart has emerged as a very effective means of providing full hemodynamic replacement for patients that have biventricular failure. And there is a growing need beyond just conventional heart failure. We're using it in failed congenital heart disease, infiltrative myopathies, arrhythmias, and other things as well. That advances in materials and our understanding of valves and fabrication and patient selection and all this and, re uh, and trial design and reimbursement were all necessary to bring this thing forward. The present challenges we're dealing with are miniaturizing the pneumatic drive technology and then getting better uh, battery uh, technology to make this uh, more user-friendly as an outpatient. The Freedom Driver has allowed us to get closer to that, to first now allow patients to go home, to be out of the hospital. But this is really the key concept here that I uh, put together for you. The key to biomedical corporate success is to keep an eye on the ball of all the moving parts. It's essential to realize that differing needs will emerge at differing stages in the natural history of a company, that the company and the board must be ready to act to continue to course correct the evolution towards the goal. I was the CEO for a while. My role and, and uh, forte is in the initial phase in the startup. 
In the operational phase, not so much so. So it's time to get off the train and bring someone else in. And you have to have that within you to recognize that it's not about you, it's about the success of the corporate effort. And you have to know how to handle that from a management perspective. So I'd say that Syncardia is getting there. They have moved from D1 to D2 and now D3. And I think hopefully within the next two or three years, we will have an even larger D3 in terms of delivering in the future. Thank you very much.